have been taking a journey to discover the reasons for celebrating Christmas. I know that we know the story, and I think we know the story well, but I think there is such depth and so much importance. Um, it seems that the Lord is drawing our attention back to one word that keeps coming up in every lesson, and that is response. Our response to Christmas. That's not by design, but no matter what we address, it has to do with what is our response to this special day. Today we're going to talk about um, part three, uh, something happened that changed the universe. Next week, Pastor Corey is going to take us into the story of Mary and going to talk about her response and how that affects us. Then the day after Christmas, we'll finish up with number five and we'll talk about what child is this and we'll see the one that we're really worshiping and celebrating. But today I want us to turn to Matthew chapter two. I tell you in 1973, I guess it was, um, I heard a message by Herschel Hobbs who was a pastor in Oklahoma. He was a great Baptist preacher. He's in heaven now. But he talked about the responses of Christmas. And the, out, the, the message is mine, but the outline is his. It so impacted me way back then when I was a freshman in college that Christmas has never really quite been the same for me since. Oh, I had the basics and I didn't falsely worship before. But I realized that there was a lot going on. I, I made a statement one time that I realized was so flawed. And I said, nobody understood the impact that would come out of that first Christmas day. They'd have to wait 30 years before they begin to see the fruit of that day. But you know, I was wrong. I, I mean, what I said was technically right. There would be a 30 year wait before the ministry of Jesus was fully manifested. But at the same time, the Gospels tell the story of Christ's birth that is full. It is full of dynamic Christianity. <laughs> I knew it was coming. I don't ever want to be surprised, but I knew it was coming. Of dynamic Christianity and, and Christianity... <laughs> that needs to be lived out. So thank you, thank you. That's what I was waiting on was a blessing to put an end to this. <laughs> Matthew chapter 2, we're going to find out that Matthew 2, now usually when we read the Christmas story, I do this almost every year on Christmas Eve, I read the Christmas story from Luke because it is so poetic, it is so beautiful, it is so majestic. And it's just the classic one. I mean, they even used it on uh, Charlie Brown Christmas. You know, even, even Charles Schultz understood the dynamic of that Luke passage telling the story. But Matthew chapter 2 does something that only a few people generally catch. And it is this. There are four Old Testament prophecies that were missed were missed by those who lived them out and saw them. And three out of the four had a secondary meaning that the Holy Spirit attributed that nobody saw except Matthew and maybe a handful of others that had been involved in the ministry of Jesus. So I want us to look at Matthew chapter 2. I want us to see these four Old Testament prophecies, and the responses that people had. You know what Matthew 2 really teaches us? Matthew 2 teaches us this. There is the story, but there's the story behind the story. There is Christmas, but there's Christmas behind Christmas. And so much depends on us not just knowing facts, but on us knowing the message that the Holy Spirit is trying to impart to us. Let's read the passage. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, 
Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them the time, uh, what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star uh, that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I have called my son. That's from the prophet Hosea. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious. And he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem. And in all the region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men, then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, and being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee and went and lived in a city called Nazareth, that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled, he shall be called a Nazarene. Let's kind of position ourselves to understand this chapter and the responses. Uh, Matthew 2, as I said, is built around the fulfillment of four Old Testament prophecies concerning Messiah. Now, loved ones, let me tell you, other than the first one, which was clear and obvious, Every one of them is layered in such a way that the heart of the religious leaders totally missed it. It was a problem throughout the Gospels. These other uh, three fulfilled prophecies, they never wrap their heads around. Now, let me tell you this. God does something that is not a science. It's an art. And only the Holy Spirit can walk us through it. There's not a formula to follow. But the Holy Spirit has designed many scriptures in the Old Testament, not all of them, but he's designed many of them to have an obvious overt meaning. And then there are other truths that are hidden in there and we draw from them. Now I've got to issue a warning first and foremost especially those of us that believe in, you know, we're not cessationists. We believe in the ongoing ministry of the Holy Spirit. We, we believe God is still speaking, but we've got to be careful. That does not give us permission to violate the word of God. 
we do not have permission to make the scriptures allegorical or symbolic. It's a very fine line and it's only by the true revelation of the Holy Spirit. And I want to tell you, I, I, am, I am most fearful and I am most on my face before God in moments when I feel the Holy Spirit is making some application to my life in a scripture that departs from the, from the natural meaning. Are, are you understanding what I'm saying? It, it, it happens, but if we're not careful, we will create, you know, we fuss at cessationists who say God doesn't do this anymore. And we create an error that's just as bad by creating our own system of interpretation that violates the clear teaching of scripture. But don't be surprised if the Holy Spirit says this and then says this happened, but there's more to it. Antichrist is a good example. Daniel talked about Antichrist and he gave the description of the ministry of Antichrist. But on the surface, it seems like Antichrist was fulfilled in the 160s BC with Antiochus Epiphanes. If you want to just say, okay, that scripture is fulfilled, you can find its fulfillment in Antiochus. But Jesus, years after Antiochus, said, watch out when that which is spoken by Daniel comes to pass, the abomination of desolation. And the religious leaders of that day said, well, that's already happened. That's when the Greeks were ruling over Palestine. Antiochus was antichrist. And it's as though Jesus and Paul both said Antiochus was an antichrist. But there's another one coming, and Paul described him in 2 Thessalonians 2. So you understand what I'm saying? Jesus gives the word and says, if you listen to the Spirit, there may be more to it if you'll have a heart that's honest toward God. He said that about John the Baptist. He said, uh, he said I will send you Elijah the prophet. And Jesus said two things that seem contradictory. It, it, John the Baptist said it himself, I am not that prophet. I am not Elijah, because they were thinking it was Elijah being sent from heaven, coming back. John said, that's not me. And Jesus says, this was a fulfillment of that scripture. You see, it's not that they're talking in shadows, but that's why Jesus, and by the way, in first Wednesday in January, we'll start our teaching on the parables, and we'll understand, we'll, we'll dig into this a little bit deeper, um, where Jesus gives teaching that on the surface is clearly able to be misunderstood, uh, or understood or misunderstood, but if you, if you have a heart that presses into God, it becomes clearer and clearer and clearer. Now, I'm not trying to confuse you today, and I, I hope I didn't just take you down a path that you don't understand. If so, just call Corey. He'll tell you what I was trying to say. But what I'm saying is that in, in Matthew chapter 2, these four things were an invitation, like the parables, to accept in faith or to reject in logic. I think that's what's at the heart of our response. We are in an age right now, we call it the information age. But we have positioned ourselves as Christians if we're not careful, we'll buy into accepting what our logic understands. And we may not understand there's something that transcends logic. And it is the witness of the Holy Spirit. It's what Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit has come, he will teach the world the true meaning of sin, the true meaning of righteousness, and the true meaning of judgment. To our cessationist friends, I would say your hermeneutical principles are not enough to understand the word of God in its fulfillment in its, and in its fullness. To us Pentecostals, I would say just because the spirit is speaking to us, do not give license to your imagination and to a false method of biblical interpretation like allegory. We must Whichever vein of Christianity we live in, we must come on bended knee, bowing to the fullness of the Holy Spirit, because the truth of the gospel is not always logical. It's not illogical, but it transcends logic. And I think Christmas, 
I think one of the deepest lessons that the birth of Christ brings to us is the understanding that if we walk in the principles of the kingdom, it will be by faith. It will be by the ministry of the Holy Spirit and not by what our mind can grasp. Am I, am I, am I, are you able to grasp what I'm saying here? Okay. Now, here's first prophecy. He was born in Bethlehem. Now that's not a hard one. Micah 5, 2. His parents did not live in, in, uh, in Bethlehem. They lived up here in Nazareth. But God arranged an order for taxation. See, God can even use the IRS. I'm, I'm feeling deep resistance. Okay, let, let, me, let me take that back. No, I'm, I'm, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Any, any agents in here, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. God ordained the office of income for Caesar to arrange a census for the purpose of taxation and it was arranged at just the time for the child to be born. It wasn't just a general time. You know, Paul would write to the Galatians, but in the fullness of time, God sent forth his, his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those of us that were under the law. Everything had reached full maturity. Full maturity. And um, uh, somebody, a farmer, told me one time, I said, well, how do you know when... These things, these peaches are really ripe. He said, if you want to know when they're perfectly ripe, he said, you stand out here and when you see one fall, grab it. He says, that is the ultimate, penultimate moment of perfection. But we don't catch them like that. We usually get them a little before. We usually get them a little after. But Jesus' birth was exactly at the right time. Everything was ordained by heaven and imposed over the calendar of earth. Um, oh, let, me, let, me, let me save that. He, but he, he was born in Bethlehem and God got them to Bethlehem right on time. Right on time. Number two, he was called out of Egypt. Now this is where the mystery begins. Because when you read Hosea 11.1, 1, the text of Hosea 11.1 1, it doesn't appear to have anything to do with Messiah. Nothing at all. God was talking about calling, if I'm interpreting it correctly, God was talking about calling the nation of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. And in regard to that Passover, he said, out of Egypt have I called my son. He did call Egypt his son in three or four passages. So I've got Egypt out of, or I got Israel out of Egypt by calling them out. That's what the prophet Hosea said. But the Holy Spirit said, hey, there's another calling of another son out of Egypt. And God said, there's a meaning to this verse that goes a step deeper. And, and there's every indication it was totally missed by those who were there for that first Christmas. A third prophecy. His birth was accompanied by great sorrow and mourning. See, they, they didn't associate the birth of Messiah, the king, to be associated with mourning and sorrow. We don't, we don't I mean, I know mom goes, you know, goes right down to death almost in the delivery of a child, but we celebrate we celebrate. Now, one, I think it was, I think it was Adrian Rogers used to say, we don't celebrate every child. And I, I, you know, and I thought, well, he needs to explain that. He said, there was a man that named his son Theophilus. And somebody said, why would you name him Theophilus? He said, because he's Theophilus looking kid I've ever seen in my life. Well, that's not what we're talking about here. And it wasn't the pain of childbirth when it was great sorrow and mourning. Uh, in Jeremiah 31, 15, it says there was a cry heard in Ramah, the mothers unable to be comforted because of what was happening to their children. In the context of Jeremiah, Jeremiah was, see, was seeing the deportation of Israel to Judah. 
Ramah, Bethlehem area. It was only about six miles from Jerusalem. And that was a staging area for the exiles to be sent out of the land. Parents were losing connection with their children and people were losing their land. People were, it was a scene of great devastation. And it was a time they were beyond comforting and beyond uh, uh, understanding. That's what Jeremiah was talking about. And Matthew said, the city, the little town that saw such weeping and mourning hundreds of years ago is going to see weeping and mourning again. Those parents are going to be just as uh, uh, um, unconsolable as the ones being sent off into exile were. But they didn't see that. They didn't see that. And then here's the one that's the most mysterious. He shall be called a Nazarene. There is no Old Testament passage that says those words of Messiah. He shall be called a Nazarene. But Isaiah 53 tells us this. Messiah will come like a root out of dry ground. Now we, we say a root out of dry ground, you know. What the prophet was saying is when Messiah comes, he will spring forth in a place that nobody saw coming. Well, how can he spring out of a place that nobody saw coming? Well, he would be born in Bethlehem, but he would be raised in Nazareth. And I believe it was a play on words when, they, when the scripture said, Uh, He will be a root out of dry ground. We don't get it in in English. That doesn't even sound alike. He he will be a root out of dry ground. He will be called a Nazarene. We say, I don't get it. But in Hebrew, the words sound very, very, very much alike. And I believe it was a Holy Spirit play on words. He was saying, when I'm telling you that he will appear like a root out of dry ground, nobody will look for this. Nobody will understand this. So he'll be called a Nazarene. It's sort of like what they said about Herod. I don't want to lose you now. Stay with me. Not because I'm preaching deep, but I'm preaching complicated. Just just for a minute. Augustus, Caesar Augustus said of Herod, it's because Herod was a notorious murderer. He killed his children, killed his wife. When he came to power, he ordained that all the members of the Sanhedrin would be murdered. I mean, he was just bloodthirsty. And this is what Caesar Augustus said about Herod. He said, it's safer to be Herod's sow than to be Herod's son. Well, that kind of, you say, well, that kind of sounds alike. But in Greek, it's safer to be Herod's huius or hus than his huius. The word sounded almost alike, and it was a proverb in Israel. It's safer to be his sow than to be his son. And what the Holy Spirit was saying in Isaiah, he said he is going to be netzer. He's going, that, that netzer, he's going to be a root out of dry ground. You will see him spring up, and everybody will say, what is it doing there? Why did this thing spring up here? And Netzer and Nazarene in the Hebrew form sound very much alike. You see, let me remind you, when they were considering the the religious leaders whether Jesus could be the Messiah, they said no, no prophet has ever come from Nazareth. First of all, they were talking about the area. First of all, that's wrong. There were about four significant prophets that came from that area. But when you're wrong about one thing, it just leads to error in other things. And uh, they were saying he can't be, there. no prophet would come out of Nazareth. But they didn't understand he was a root out of dry ground. He was a prophet out of Nazareth. Are you with me? Okay, you're with me, good. And and they missed that as well. They never understood. Even one of his own disciples, when he heard, who who are you saying Jesus, uh, this Messiah is? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And one of the disciples said, hey, can anything come out of good come out of Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? You know what he was saying literally? Can a, can a root spring out of dry ground? Jesus did, 
because he was a Nazarene. He was a Netzer. He was a root out of dry ground. So he was born in Bethlehem. That was easy. But they never understood that he was born in Bethlehem, but he didn't live in Bethlehem because they killed all the babies in Bethlehem thinking we've solved the problem. But they never understood that he was born in Bethlehem, but he didn't live in Bethlehem. He was called home out of Egypt. They didn't have a clue. His birth was accompanied by great sorrow and mourning. They didn't have a clue. He shall be called a Nazarene. They didn't have a clue. But what we find is in the midst of all of this need for digging, everything hinges on the decision that was made. Thank you, my brother. Let's so do this without falling over. Thank you. Let's talk about the responses quickly. And by the way, I'm going to cover a lot of stuff about the responses. I'm going to help you see where there might be two or three options that you can take, but, but you don't have to agree with me to go to heaven. Just Jesus is the only thing we've got to agree on here. Here's, here's the first response that we see, and it was the response of the star. We call it the response of nature. And the response of nature was submission. Nature, the cosmos, operates on a set standard of rules and laws. The stars move the way they do. The, the sun shines the way it does. The earth rotates the way that it does because of a set of laws that God put in motion. These laws aren't separate from God. God put the laws in motion. But every now and then God says, I call on that I've set in motion to bow its knee to me and to walk in submission. During the days of Hezekiah, God was showing a miracle. And he said, shall I let the sun move forward or shall I let the sun move backwards to show that I'm the same God that's in charge of the universe is in charge of your life. And Hezekiah said, well, the sun's naturally going to move forward. Let the sundial move backwards. And God caused everything in the cosmos. I don't know if you've thought about this, Everything in the cosmos suddenly stops and moves back at the word of God. It's called submission. Submission. Or Joshua says, Lord, you've promised us victory over our enemies. And Lord, it's within grasp. But if the night falls, they'll get away and this battle may not be won. So God says, well, what do you want me to do? And he says, son, stand still. Moon, don't come up yet. You stay right where you are. And God caused this entire cosmos to come to a screeching halt for several hours while Israel finished the job. Submission. You know, I've got a prophet that's in rebellion. I need, to, I need him to understand the significance of his rebellion. I need you boys to throw him off the ship. But I need to get him from the water to Nineveh. So what did God do? He said, well, if I, if I have this calculated correct, I can count on this current. to No, it's very simple. It says God prepared a great fish. I don't think that great fish existed. Now, it could mean that God just brought the fish along. I know that. But I think God just said, I need a great fish. And I need a fish that is designed, and, it, and it, they've shown it could have been a whale, but God says, I need it to keep Jonah alive. I need it to have a capacity inside to host one of the greatest prayer meetings that has ever been held. <laughs> and I need him to be so changed that when he is spit up on the shore with fish vomit and seaweed and everything on him, and he looks at the people and says, repent, they do it. Submission, submission. Let's talk about this star for just a minute. Now some, and if, if you get your theology from the History Channel, you probably know what I'm talking about. They say that Halley's Comet was seen in that area in about 11 BC. Maybe, maybe the star was Halley's Comet. Well, 11 BC was too early. Um, we, we uh, I mean, just the, the story as we know it, it was too early. And 
<coughs> it doesn't act like a comet. This is a, this is a star that moves, goes this way, moves, and then stops over a house. You know, if we had a magnificent star, everybody here could say, it's over my house, you know. Yeah, it's over Columbia. Yeah, it's over South Carolina. It's over America. But this star had movement so distinct that they could pick out a house from other houses. Okay? And 11 BC was too early for the birth of Jesus anyway. We know that he was born during the days of Herod the king. We know Herod the king died in 4 BC. So most scholars, and, and it's not a matter of faith, you don't have to believe this, <coughs> but, but a lot of biblical scholars believe that Christ was born between 5 and 7 BC. If you watch The Chosen, I don't know if you've ever picked up on this, <coughs> I don't know who decided, but they do a masterful job of splitting the dates between scholars. Everything from the Exodus to the birth of Jesus. They, they do have this estimate and this estimate, and they put it in the middle, you know, which is probably a safe thing to do. But we can be pretty sure that Jesus was born between 5 and 7 BC. And you say, wait a minute, no, he should have been born in year one. I mean, that's, if, he, if the Bible's true, he's born in year one. These dates don't come from the Bible. These dates come from our calendar, and our calendar, the Gregorian calendar, we've changed calendars a couple of times. So what we thought was year one is probably about 5 um, to 7 B.C., right in there. I think Jesus was born in 5 or 6 B.C. But you know what? You can say, Pastor, I think you're wrong, and I can still go to heaven. <laughs> and you can still go to heaven. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the year that Jesus was born. What matters is that he was born, according to Scripture. In 7 and 6 B.C., there was a conjunction of Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars. And some scholars have said, well, it, it must have been the alignment of these planets that they saw as um, you know, a new star. It was just natural events. Well, again, you got, now you've got not only a star that's zigzagging, but you've got planets that are zigzagging. And another thing, uh, the, Matthew's Greek text uses the word aster, which is a plural. It, would, it um, uh, is the word for a single star. It was a single star. If it was a conjunction of stars or planets, he would have used astron. We get astronomy from that, but that's not the word he used. Matthew was very clear. It was one singular body, so it was not a conjunction of three planets. And besides, they have proven that even though that alignment of planets was at the right time, that they would have never been closer together than the apparent diameter of the moon. In other words, if you see a full moon, you know that it's in that space that these three planets appeared close to each other, but never as a single great star. We, we've proven that scientifically. Um, you say, well, then, then what was the star? It's very simple. It was his star. That's what the scripture says. It was his star. And loved ones, I want to tell you the first thing that we see indicating response to Jesus is the response of nature. And nature set aside every law. Nature set aside what modern science says cannot be broken. Everything's put on hold and God makes his star. It's submission. The first dynamic of having a Merry Christmas and understanding it is that we submit. We submit to the story. We submit to the baby. We submit to the gospel. Well, let me hurry. <clears throat> There's a second response, and that is the response of the magi, the response of the wise men. Another way of putting it is the response, and I think this is the way Dr. Hobbes put it, the response of the Gentiles. You see, <clears throat> that is not a big deal to us, but you've got to understand when the Messiah's birth was presented to the religious leaders of Israel, that was an impossibility that Gentiles would be welcomed to the birth of the king, let alone that they would be first responders to the birth of the king. This isn't in the Bible, but it's in rabbinical writings. A devout Pharisee every morning would begin his day with this. O oh God of the universe, I thank you and give you praise that I am neither a Gentile 
a woman, or a tax collector? How would you like your praise and worship to begin every day with, I'm not a woman, I'm not a tax collector, and I'm not a Gentile. That, that did not come from the heart of God, but that came from the heart of a religious system that didn't understand. They were God's peculiar people. They were set apart. But loved ones, they were set apart not to be aloof. They were set apart to be an attraction. God wanted all of us Gentiles to look at Israel and say, that's what I want to be. That's what I want to be a part of. God said to Moses, they will look at you and though you're so small, they will say, how have you walked in such prosperity and how have you walked in such blessing? You are the smallest of nations, but you are undefeated in battle. How can this be? God said, I have created you with favor so that they would look at you and say, how can this happen? And your response is to be, it's not the size of our army. It's not the square miles of our nation, but it is the hand of Almighty God that rests upon us. And somewhere along the line, Israel, and I'm not blaming them, we all tend to do the same thing. Israel lost the understanding of their true distinction. They were distinct to glorify God, but they made themselves distinct to glorify themselves. And God said, I'm going to remind you of what all of this is about. It's in my name that the Gentiles shall trust. You read about the, you, you read the Old Testament prophets and the majority of them talk about the, the nations of the earth coming to him and coming to Jerusalem and being brought into fellowship with God. God's gonna bless Israel. God has not written off Israel. God still has a special place for Israel in his plan. But his plan all along is that all of the nations of the world will be blessed. Whether we're Gentile in general, Arab in particular, it doesn't matter. God said, I'm going to bring all the nations of the earth. That's why there was that big meeting in Acts chapter 15 that to us just seems like an interruption of the, of the good stuff. But Israel had to learn at the Jerusalem council that God said, you do not have to become a Jew to find God. That was huge. You do not have to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses. The law of Moses was instruction. It was a schoolmaster. <coughs> it was something that was bringing you to truth. But God said, all of the Gentiles are welcome. And that was the second response. It was, a, it was the worship of the Gentiles. It was more than three wise guys showing up to give gifts, <coughs> it was a prophetic statement saying the whole world will come. Oh, in our congregation, we have some people from Jewish heritage and, and they are such a vital part of our congregation. We love them, but most of us are Gentiles. Most of us are Gentiles. Uh, uh, a man told me the other day when I said, uh, most of us are Gentiles, uh, his little boy in elementary school said, Dad, you told me we were rednecks. <laughs> and you might be Gentile redneck, but you're still, most of us are Gentile. And loved ones, we are gathered here today. We are gathered in, in full fellowship with the Lord because God said, I'm going to show you something on this first Christmas day. And it was the, it was the gathering of the wise men, the Gentiles will trust in his name. Thirdly, there was the response of the Jews. Now I have to say this because I don't want to sound anti-Semitic. I'm talking about the religious leaders because the shepherds were Jews and boy, their response, their response isn't in this chapter, that's in the other gospels, but the response of the shepherds was phenomenal. I mean, the angels said, glory to God in the highest peace on earth and goodwill toward all of you with whom God is pleased. I mean, some of the Jews, they got a special invitation. God is doing what he's doing because he's pleased with you. But that wasn't the response of the Jewish leaders, not, not by and large. We, um, we find out, and, and you can see your notes for more information about who the, the Magi were. They, they, I, my belief is that the Magi had their roots in the teaching of Daniel. But we move on to number three, the response of the Jews, and it was unbelief. 
You know, the most dangerous place to be is to know enough about God to harden your heart to who he really is. The chief priests and the scribes, this was their response to the king. It was unbelief. When the Magi questioned Herod about the birth of the king, the scribes and chief priests were brought in to discover where Christ would be born. They, re they replied, Micah 5, 2. But as I said a week or so ago, they did nothing about it. If I, boy, I better not say that. I started to say, if I'd been told that the king was born, he's supposed to be born in Bethlehem, the first thing I'm going to do, I'm calling the Hampton in Bethlehem. I'm booking a room. I'm going. But then I have to ask myself, would I? Would, would I really go? You know, I've, I've, I, I know what it's like to travel great distances because I hear of a move of God in a place. Sometimes I'm glad I went, and sometimes I thought it was a waste of time. I, and, I, and I wonder, you know, how willing am I to really go when God says there's something happening? Sometimes we have trouble just showing up on Sunday. Sometimes we have trouble just opening our Bibles. Now, I, I'm, I've decided I'm not going to be too hard on the chief priests and scribes. They made a mistake that I don't want to make. They had knowledge but they did not act on the knowledge. Um, the response was to do nothing. They should have led the way in worship. The chief priests and the scribes should have said, guys, go get your camel pack. We're going to meet here tomorrow morning and we are heading toward Bethlehem. And somebody would have said, no, it's only six miles. We can be there for supper. And they should have led the procession. Right now to this point, the only worshipers we have are the lowly shepherds of Bethlehem and despised Gentiles from Babylon. They missed such an opportunity. Well, let me give you the last response, and it was King Herod. Okay, now, I know that I need to be submissive to the gospel. I know that I need to be thankful because even though I'm not Jewish, I am welcomed, I am included in the family of God. And God says to those of us who were not his people by distinction of Jew and Gentile, he says, whosoever will may come. I, I have to be careful that I don't allow myself to know enough that it hardens my heart. And I, I don't want to be one that ought to be the first in line to worship but instead I cling to unbelief because it comes in a way I don't see or understand. But Herod, Herod's one that I think we need to be careful of because of the age and the culture in which we live. His response was anger. Now you say, well, anger? Yeah, he was incensed and that led to the slaughter of the innocents. But let me tell you about Herod. Herod was in the same boat as the chief uh, scribes and Pharisees in that he knew the, 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 the prophets. He, he was an uh, Edomian or an Edomite and was a half Jew, but even though he was half Jew, now you would have thought, see, that's when we got to be careful when we, put our, when we put our trust in politics. Now again, don't get me wrong, it matters who's in the White House, it matters who's in the government. Uh, a governor's mansion. It matters who's the mayor of a city. It matters who's on your school board. I know that. But we have to be careful of making two great mistakes. We have to be careful of thinking that politics don't matter. And then we have to be careful of thinking that politics are all that matter. Because often it is easy to settle on somebody that we think is, quote, one of us, and they're not one of us at all. They would have been happy with Herod. In fact, we knew that some were hoping he would be appointed to leadership because he was Roman, but he was half Jew. He will understand us. So what he did upon his installment as the leader over the region is he took the Supreme Court of Israel, the Sanhedrin, and he had them all executed. It's not a good start. He 
over the course of his administration, he reigned from 40 B.C. to 4 B.C. So, in other words, he reigned from the days of Caesar Augustus and Mark Anthony to just after the birth of Jesus. And he was such a disappointment that he was called Herod the Great Pervert. You know, some of us grew up being called Slugger. Some of us grew up being called Princess. How would you like to grow up being called the great pervert? You know, that's what Herod faced. He ruled in Jerusalem from 40 BC to 4 BC. He was a phenomenal organizer. If you've gone to us with us to Israel, you've been to the ruins of his palace there at, uh, at Masada. He was a strange combination of compassion and treachery of genius and insanity. He did good things, like during famine years, he emptied the treasury to buy food for his people, but he began his reign, as I said, by killing the Sanhedrin. Let me tell you about Herod, the great pervert. He was so power hungry, <clears throat> I know we've shared this before, but he's one of the major players in this story. He was so power hungry that he killed two of his sons, the two that he called his favorite sons. Now I think you got problems when you start having a favorite child. But he had two and he killed them both. He killed another son. For good measure, he killed his mother-in-law, his brother-in-law, and even his wife that he called his favorite wife, Mary Omni. He, 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 he loved her more than he loved life but apparently not quite that much because he killed her. But to prove his love for her, he had her pickled so that everybody would be able to look on her and see that she was his favorite wife. And that's what caused Augustus to say it would be safer to be Herod's sow, Hus, than his son, Huyus. He knew he was hated so that uh, when he died, he knew that his death would, would come one day. So he ordered that when he died, the prominent families of Jerusalem would be murdered, or at least the heads of the prominent families, because he said, there's going to be mourning in this city on the day of my death. And he knew it wouldn't be any mourning for him. Thankfully, the order was not carried out. Herod is typical of everyone who chooses to keep their own agenda in place against the will of God. Loved ones, that is the society that I fear we are living in today. I fear, and, and I'm, not, I'm not preaching today to condemn society. You know what Paul said to the Corinthian church? He said, you need to quit judging folks on the outside. He says, they're not family. You have nothing to do with them. He said, what I'm concerned about is the way and what you allow in the family. So I, I, I'm not here to say, oh, the culture is going to hell in the handbasket and just go on to hell with you. No, that's not what I'm preaching. But I tell you what I am preaching. I know that if we're not careful, it is easy for us to absorb the atmosphere of the culture in which we live. See, our college kids, we've got, we've got to do more than just tell them, boy, you're walking into the devil's den you know, none of those professors love God, which isn't true, but we need to teach them how to stand and not let the culture of this world be absorbed by them. I think of Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. I think of Daniel. And here are people that lost their family, lost their culture. They even lost their names. They, they tried to make them lose their religion, but there was something in them that stood against the onslaught of a hostile culture. Herod, Herod decided he would follow culture. And he is typical, as I said, of everyone who chooses to keep their own agenda in place against the will of God. Just think what could have happened if Herod and the chief scribes and the Pharisees, just think what could have happened if they would have told the Magi, look, it's Bethlehem, just wait, hold on, hold on. We will go with you and we will worship. The whole world would have been changed. Now, the question that we have today is what's going to be our response? 
in a, in a very broad, general sense, we need to be submissive. And in a thankful sense, if, if we're Gentile, we need to be thankful that God included us in the Christmas celebration. If you are Jewish, then you need to look around at all of us who are Gentile and say, oh, look how God has extended the family. Look how God has blessed the family. If you are a religious person and all of a sudden you realize you're filled with a lot of stuff, you're filled with, I want Messiah to come, but I want him to come on my terms. I want God to move among the nation, but I, I want him to do it my way. You might need to back up and just say, do I just have a collection of facts or have the facts entered me and changed me? Worst of all cases, are you a Herod? Even though you may be a member of this church, are you a Herod? Because I'm, I want to tell you, the older you get, I, I'm a, I can testify to this, the older you get, the less lovely change looks to you. The less accepting of change you are. There was no significant problem with an 8-track. I mean, the worst case is it interrupted a song, but that just gave you time to regroup before you finished the song. You know, people tell me, Pastor, just download it. You won't have to have a physical whatever. Hey, if I can't hold it in my hand, I don't have it. Bill Gates or somebody's going to take everything I got on my computer. He's going to take it. I want something I can take and bury in the backyard. You know, we joke, we joke about that. Um, I, I told my son, I said, when the first time I bought a, you know, a, a newer car, and, and it was in the 80s, I took my toolbox out of my old car and, I, and I, I, I had the hood raised. You know, everybody, if you don't understand it, you raise the hood to look at it. I raised the hood and I had my toolbox in my hand. I was going to, about to put in the trunk because I'd always traveled with a toolbox. You never know when you got to do something, the carburetor, a fuel pump, or a belt, or whatever. I looked under the hood. I closed it and I took my toolbox and threw it over the fence into the backyard. <laughs> See, you know what I found out? I found out that, that we, we can be so sure that we've got a grip on everything that the old ways become a God to us instead of God himself. I think that's happening in a lot of churches. I think that's, and, and don't get me wrong, I think there's a lot of problems with a lot of our churches. I, I, don't, I, don't think our, I don't think our younger pastors are staying true to the gospel the way I want them to. I, I, I mean in a broad stroke of the brush. There are certainly many, many exceptions to that. I think we're teaching our young pastors and church leaders that it's more important to be relevant than it is to be factual that it's more important to be able to be a good communicator than to be a man or woman of God. And there are wonderful exceptions to that. I, I know that. I know that. But I'm telling you, there is a tremendous pressure, even observable during Christmas, to say, I know. I know. But everything that I know has to conform to the way I want it to be. And loved ones, I think the days ahead, I, I don't, I'm, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying we need to move away from traditional roots. I'm, no, I'm saying just the opposite. We need to move back to them. But at the same time, we've got to not let the new things that God is doing poison us. 
it's, it's, it's a fine line. You've got to let God do everything new he wants to do, but you like, you've got to be sure it's God doing something new and not just the church. You've got to let God do things that are marvelous, even though they're beyond your expectation or approval. But you need to be sure it's what God is doing. You say, well, pastor, how do we keep that balance? Oh, that's why we're focusing on fullness next year. But I tell you what it boils down to. Like never before, you and I are going to have to operate from the lap of Jesus. We're going to have to draw near and hear him as never before. And if we're not careful, we'll go off being convinced. Jesus put it this way. Many will say, you know, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do this, that, and the other in your name? And Jesus will say, you missed it totally in the name of religion. Uh, That's kind of a vague note to end on. But let me summarize it this way. Get in the arms of Jesus and stay there. Whatever he wants you to do, let him tell you. Let him confirm it to you. Don't be caught up in the currents and trends of this world. Father, please help us to respond well. Even when the verses carry us beyond what we understand. Don't let us miss something phenomenal because we're not going deep enough in you. Help us, Lord. Help us.